Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 234. We're at the end of April. Time is flying and I don't have anything else to say about it but that. As always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. Although if you're in chat, it's great to have you here with us, even if you are dealing with the 10 second delay. Sorry, Zach. All right, what are we doing today? We're doing what we're always been doing lately. Uh, we're doing triage. And if you haven't said hi, go ahead and said hi. Uh, Zach, Blair, Ron, great to have you with us, guys. Uh, yeah, we'll do triage, and then we'll take any questions and things like that that people want to talk about. And we are still digging out of a bit of a backlog of issues that were not filed. So let's go ahead and jump into the new issues, and then we'll jump in and dig through some of that backlog. Bob, are you ready? I am. Let's go. All righty. Um... Top issue, 6765, remove the 160 character limit for custom action entry points. So I, I love this, like we put our 60 in there just as a random. Um, this limit is actually imposed because of the way that the DLL has to call into the other entry points, right? Yeah. So I mean. It's, it's weird. And there's not a lot of, you know, like, why did we do it this way? But I remember all the, the 160 was like a, random amount of space that wouldn't unnecessarily bloat the native DLL, as I recall. Yeah, and there's like a limit of 256 or 255 or something like yeah, that. There's two yeah. limits. There's this one multiplied by the other one, and that's how much space we have to work with right now. So there's the feature request. I think we should toss it into, they can go into 4X if they want to go dig into it. They're welcome to go diagnose all the pieces and see what the right, you know, what's the next level set of uh, things for us to expand those pages to, or for them to, because I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I, it, I'm okay with taking it. It's it's one of those. I, I yeah, agree with you. Do. I think there's there's still an upper limit, and it's not that far away. It's not like we can make it unlimited. I don't think so. I think there's gonna it's gonna end up being a page. I think it has to be pre-built, so. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's not arbitrary. I mean, it's arbitrary that it was picked, and now it's, you know, if you want to go over that, you have to redesign the thing to handle more. Pretty straightforward. Uh, set MSI package visible when permanent equals yes. Right, I think, yeah, okay. I accidentally opened this when I was running as Wixbot. I think this came from our conversation last time about bundle package visible permanent behaviors rather being visible when you set it permanent and that MSI should do the same. So I already gave this to me. I don't, does anybody disagree? I think we all agreed. I think we all agreed. Okay. I so, think so this doesn't need triage. It just needs to go into the compiler. And we'll carry on. Uh, harvesting non-compressed bundle packages should probably add payloads. Six, seven, five, seven, Sean. So it looked like you guys went through a lot of different iterations when creating the original MSI package. And you guys went from harvesting nothing to eventually harvesting everything in the MSI. And then bundles have pretty much the same concepts as MSI because they have containers, they have payloads, you know, like cabs and file table in MSI. So we need to figure out what we want to harvest for bundles. Yeah, it's that's an interesting question because I don't think bundles should. All right, let's step back. MSIs we need to harvest because MSIs can get into source prompt issues, and so the goal was the package cache would uh, remove all cases where those would require, as long as the package cache was handled correctly. So we would gather all the files that the Windows installer could need and cache them with the bundle to protect the Windows installer from itself. Bundles, on the other hand, cache their own things. So if we cached a child bundle's content, then you'd get that all in a folder, and then that child bundle presumably would install, and it would cache all of its stuff again in the package cache. But, but if you cache bundles. the package and you don't install it the first time, then when you try to install it later, it's going to be missing things. And it's going to need a source prompt or the ability to find all its content. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's tricky. I mean, it could, if we cash, I mean, it essentially would be cashing the bundle twice because it was nested, which is not ideal. But the bundle might not be keeping its cash. So there's a lot of different. But if it doesn't keep its cash, here. then, I mean, presumably it. It's going to have to, yeah, yeah, because, right, the problem is going to be when it says, hey, I need these files, it's not going to have the ability to ask for them if it is nested inside another bundle. Hmm. I'm trying to think of what's the least surprise. It probably should be an option. Yeah, I, if, if we do it, it probably should be an option. Like you can harvest nothing, you can harvest everything, and then probably in the middle of the road, like everything that doesn't have a download URL or something like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so many, so many options. Yeah, everything that doesn't have a download URL is also interesting. Or I guess I wrote this up as everything that's not compressed would be another option. Is it really a parent bundle problem? Yeah, Jacob, we have to decide if the parent bundle copies the full content of the child bundle to the package cache. Do we also have a problem where if external files are, if external payloads are required, if a child bundle has other files, external containers or external files, and is nested in a parent bundle, when the parent bundle runs, it's going to first cache the child bundle, right? And then right. launch it from the package cache to make sure it can't be modified while we're launching the process. If those loose files are not next to the bundle in that case, isn't the bundle going to be very confused? It's going to be like, hey, I'm the child bundle's going to be like, hey, where's my stuff? It should be right next to me. Yeah, that's what I meant by non compressed external. Well, but there's a mix of, because you can still have files that are arbitrarily laid out, yeah. arbitrary payloads, right? Too. Then there's the, the package payloads. And then there are those that could be downloaded. So you guys are talking about the layout only payloads? Well, both. The layout only payloads, I think, have to be harvested because, as Rob points out, if you have a dependency on a DLL and that dependency is not to be found, then that could be bad. No, no layout, I mean, layout, kind of... layout only payloads are actually the ones that are only used when you do a layout switch. Uh, okay. There are also yeah. loose files, loose payloads, external oh. payloads. The, there's external payloads which are expected to be used by the bundle during installation. There are layout only payloads that are also loose and only used during layout. I thought we got rid of those. Layout only? Yeah. Mm, uh, da, da, da. No. Okay. I don't think so. Sean says no. That's good enough. But the yeah. loose external files, those are, those would only be associated with packages. There's mm. not a bundle level concept of a loose payload. Oh, that's interesting. I thought I thought you could still do that, just have arbitrary payloads. But I guess I'm thinking of of arbitrary UX payloads, which are always in a container. Yeah, that's different. Mm, that's interesting then. 
I think we have to cache them. At least for the install. But I agree it needs to be an option because if just because something has a download URL doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be used. I mean, we author download URLs for you know, the .NET Framework redistributable package groups. Um, we should probably, yeah. You know, we don't want to break someone who expects to be able to do an offline install. Yeah, but that's a perfect case of to think about if there are many bundles out there that depend on .NET Framework and you end up nesting them in a parent package, each of the child bundles will get a copy of the .NET Framework installation yeah. source media, if, I mean, if, if they carried it with them. Yeah. So you end up with the .NET Framework in the package cache many times. Yeah, but if they use, well, but if it's an XE, sorry, if it's an XE package rather than an XE package with a remote payload, it would be cached. The, the cache would be satisfied because we're going to cache only once, assuming it's the same version of the redistributable. But not when the parent bundle is doing the caching. Well, sorry, it, it would carry the payload. It wouldn't recache it if it were already present. The first one would cache it for the rest of them. Not, but, but all of no. them would have to carry it. No. So if you have a parent bundle that refers to a child bundle, and that child bundle says one of its payloads is the .NET Framework. Yeah. When the parent bundle is caching the child bundle, it doesn't know that the .NET Framework is the thing that's being cached. It's just like, I have to cache the whole child bundle. So it takes the whole child bundle, including .NET Framework and anything else, and caches it, and then we'll run it from that cache. Sorry, uh, in my head, we're, we're caching packages normally. Now I'm confused about how you would cache bundles packages it's just another payload of the bundle the payload package. of the bundle yeah okay okay uh, okay the fact that it's a .NET framework is um, no, unknown I, I, by the parent I was I was assuming that it would be cached like any other package without it being a child of the of a bundle embedded in another bundle in that case, it would be you know the hash of the package, or however we cache the the a package that's authentic code verified. But if it's just like you know, uh, I don't I don't know how how today the bundles payloads are cached. Are they literally cached as child directories of the bundle in the cache? Well, that's what I was trying to say. There, there are no payloads at the bundle level so but what we're talking about here is that this is a package of a bundle so when that parrot bundle is installing any of its packages it's going to cache every payload for that package in the package cache before it runs it right and so i'm back to the question of if we're caching identical payloads why wouldn't the first one cached satisfy the caching requirements of every other? In other words, okay, ignore the ignore the the child parent bundle question because that's where I'm coming from. You have two bundles, both of them install .NET 4.8 full redist. The first bundle you, that installs will cache the 4.8 redist. The second bundle that installs will not because it will say, oh, that cache request is already satisfied. Those two packages would have to have identical cache IDs. Correct. Yep. That's what I'm so, saying. And this scenario works identical. fine. This scenario works fine. Everything works okay. fine in this scenario. Okay. So now I'm back to the question. When you have an, a, a nested bundle and we've harvested its packages, or and maybe now I'm at the point where we just haven't done this yet. So, how are those, how are the bundles packages, 
I guess the question is, how are those nest? How are the nested bundles packages embedded? And then how are they cached? So it's like any other package type where that bundle package gets its own cache ID. So every payload that we harvest, that payloads can be part of that cache ID for that specific child bundle. Okay, so they are literally, again, subdirectories of the nested bundles cache directory? No. It wouldn't be nested directories. It would just be... It would just have one Sorry, they're, folder. They're, they're rooted the under the, the nested bundle. Yeah, the nested bundle's cache ID. Okay, okay. Got Package it. cache you. ID. Well, so going back to last meeting where we kind of concluded that the most common use case for a nested bundle is Redis. Redis aren't generally going to have a lot of dependencies embedded in them other than their you know their own they're not generally going to include other big dependencies right so the problem is uh, let's say you have a parent bundle that is nothing more than carrying a bunch of child bundles it's just a wrapper for whatever reason all right just for experiment or first case and Child A and child B both need the VC Redist. Like they both have dependence on the VC Redist. So they both install the VC Redist, right, as part of their bundles. So mm -hmm. A and B can be installed independently. When they install, one copy of the VC Redist ends up in the package cache because they're sharing the same cache ID. And everything works as we know it today. All right. Yep. Now, when we bring this parent in and it brings the two of them in, when the parent runs, it looks at cache A, it looks at package A, and it goes, cool, I need to take all of your stuff and cache it. And it does so. So VC Redis gets copied into package A's cache. Yep. And then it looks at B and it goes, oh, I need to cache all your stuff. So it picks up package B and all of its stuff ends up in cache B directory and VC Redis is duplicated again. Yep. And then the install of A happens and VC Redis gets cached itself. Mm -hmm. So now you have two full copies of VC Redis and the bundle plus all of its packages exploded in the package cache and then bundle B runs it skips the VC Redis because hey A just did it for it and then it finishes stuff yep. so the problem the issue that we're looking at is that VC Redis is duplicated both with A and B yep. wastefully okay uh, okay what do you want I mean <laughs> yeah you I, either I, I'm trying to come up with if there's anything better and I I don't disagree. I'm just trying to figure out is there a better way. Is there another well, sorry, way out? Sure. You you do what I thought it did, which is to cache the packages independently of their status as a member of a, a nested bundle. Yeah, the problem is that there's a lot of variables in that, and package I, A and package B would have to know, oh, by the way, your thing wasn't cached next to you anymore. It's actually over here. So where package A thought it was in the readists folder, and package B thought it was in the packages nested uh, you know package a xe readist folder vc readist and packages b has a uh, a foo folder with readists in a vc readist in it when they get cached they get cached into those appropriate nested directories because that's where the bundle is going to expect to find them if we were to play games with that we end up having to understand a whole lot about the internal workings of their bundles to essentially rewrite their world and i i mean I thought Bob was talking about putting it in the package cache for those bundles. Yeah, but... Oh, so if we put it in the package cache the right... But we'd have to essentially install it. No, we'd have to cache it. Which we're already doing for the bundle. Yeah. Or not. I, I, I'm not saying this is easy or yeah, even... Yeah, yeah, no, you, you know, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, I The we safest to, thing is, is to duplicate. I mean, that's just... That's... Absolutely, yep. the safest thing to do. Yep. Um, if I, I'm, I'm, I, I would have to really sit down and and look at scenarios to see if I'm as concerned as you seem to be about the you know moving the stuff around. I mean, really, packages should not be concerned about anything other than their own cache directory and anything in it. So I'm I'm not entirely 
sure that I care about, you know, um, changing expectations about that. Um, yeah. But again, I'd, I'd really have to sit down and think about it because, yeah, it, this could absolutely you know, blow up. So I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable saying that this is something we should look at, you know, in, in a 4X or a V5 and say for 4.0, it might be wasteful. That's okay. I think the problem with trying to cache it for them in the package cache location is I don't think we're correctly reference counting caching today. So we would get into mm. problems where bundles would start deleting packages from the package cache, even though other bundles depend on them. We, yeah, I know you're right. We could because um, the, the only reference count is on the actual installed package. So if a bundle carried carried the redist, and then I guess it's a it's a uh, yeah this this would be tricky. I think what this says is that child bundles have to be designed to be carried in the parent to be efficient. To be efficient, sure. I mean, you can be wasteful, of course, and you'll end up with lots of duplication all over the place and things like that. But to really... Well, potentially. Some. Some. But... And most redists are going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the answer is we have to do... We have to copy these files... Otherwise, the bundle install will fail because it's going to expect files to be cached, expect its files to be there. They're not going to be there, and it will fail when being run out of the package cache by the parent. So we have to copy them. Otherwise, things will be broken, even though that copy is potentially very wasteful if you do very simplistic, just nest one bundle and another bundle, another bundle without thinking through all the implications of the sharing that's going to happen there or the duplication that will happen there. So we're talking about all loose files and all, what, all payloads? All external all payloads. External I payloads. I think that's it. And containers. As much as they're used. That makes sense. And should we provide an option so they can opt out? Like if they have download URLs on everything. Oh. Download URLs are interesting. That's the option, I think. Should Do you want us to cache this if there's a download URL? Is it an error? It's actually, it, it kind of goes, is it an error if it can't find a file uh, an external file and it has a download URL. I didn't, I don't feel like I said that well. Um, if it's an external file, it has to be present unless it has a download URL. Then do we want to, we can make that a warning. You can suppress the warning or we could have a switch that says allow that scenario. Right. I think I prefer the idea of a warning there. Hmm. I think I yeah I think I prefer warning because it's um, I think it's because that's that's your control right yeah. your control is you could say you want to nest this bundle you could give it you know <laughs> uh, a CD image um, that contains everything but if you don't and you just want to be able to download it you just give it the you know the naked payloadless Bundle. The okay. problem with the use of download, uh, the problem with a warning is that suppressing a warning suppresses a warning for all packages. So if you wanted to ignore it on one package but not another, and mm. you wanted to catch the errors on the second one but not the first one, that's where the the warning is not quite um, sufficient. Yeah, we should probably fix that. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> then I guess an attribute. Yeah, I mean we should, right? That, that's the, the practice suppress. Ices. 
You mean Pragma Suppress kind of thing? Pragma Suppress, yeah. 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 That would be cool. We're going to have to get more and more deeper into the line numbering of Wix, which we don't do enough with today. So, yeah, That's I hear you. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, so is it a separate attribute to say... Uh, um, allow external payloads with allow missing external payloads with download URL. <laughs> right? I think that now captures you see it. why I was looking for a, a warning. That's just a four digit number. Uh, <laughs> I was more hoping for a, a harvesting type attribute where you say default or nothing. Everything. Or, or allow if it has a download URL. Allow missing if download URL. It's essentially what it comes down to. Allow missing external payloads. There's a better way of saying it. That's just the way my brain is. URLs. That's just the way my brain is processed right now. But that's what it is. The external payloads can be missing if they have a download URL. That's the the dial. Yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of... Uh, oh, so you're talking about that. harvesting based on what's actually on the file system. Well, the I parent wasn't... bundle's going to need... No. The, the, the parent bundle needs the child file. It needs to know that the child files are. The, 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 yeah, but... Like, if there's... If all the files have downloaded your... Like, you could, you could do it by looking at the manifest... That's how this is going to work. It's going to look at the manifest and then add payloads based on what's on the manifest. Unless it embeds them in itself or it's putting it in a container. I mean, the parent bundle could be reorganizing how all that's getting laid out. No, the parent bundle's going to have to move all the files to the right, into the right shape. Yeah, but I originally had no intention of looking at what actually exists on the file system at build time to depend on what to put into the bundle. But it has to, because it ends up. It could end up inside the bundle. No, but like today, if you harvest an MSI package and loose files are missing, you get a bind time error that files are missing. Right. So that's what I thought was going to happen here. The harvesting would inspect the manifest and add payloads based on what's in the manifest, and then later, when binding tries to put the files in the bundle, if it's missing, then bind time will fail like that. Oh, I see. So you want to say ignore files with download URLs? Yeah. Like harvesting is separate from the binding. No, the harvesting is a part of binding. No, because we allow remote bundle packages. Yeah, so th there's that. Can be done. Th that there's definitely that, but the one that's it has to end up inside. There are cases where it ends up inside the binding too. So it is part of binding as well. And the option here is to... I don't understand that part. Well, I, it it I feeds moved, into binding. I moved it out. I, yes, but... How does MSI package do that? Yeah. The files end up as... can Based on what the parent bundle authored, the files can end up inside the bundle. The bundle... The, the, the parent bundle being built. So as a payload of the package? As a payload of the parent bundle. The, the parent bundle could say, I'm going to compress everything inside of me. So it could point at a bunch of, of external um, uh, child bundles that are all loose payloads, like they're all flat with the idea that then there is a parent that sucks all of them up and puts them all into one big or small, however large, um, single file XE bundle. So the fact that we read a bundle and go, hey, we have found you. You have these 10 files on disk. Here's package B. You have two files. Package C, you only have your one file. Great. I'm going to need whatever the math was on those numbers to be all sucked up into the final bundle. Right, like we, we have to be able to know if we're going to find the files. So you could say ignore files with download URLs. Those then during that process would say, okay, this has a download URL. I'm not going to include it as a file that's being included for binding. That's we definitely could do it that way. 
I was operating on the, if the file's not on disk, allow it to not be in download URL. But that's, uh, those are two different dials we should definitely choose, which we pick, but they're both, at the end, we're gonna need those external files sometimes. Not in the remote payload case. In the remote payload case, they have to be download URLs. So I'm not really agreeing with what you're saying. So like when you harvest, that's when you pick which files must be included into the bundle. So you should decide at harvesting time whether you want to include uh, all the files, like nothing, or just the ones that are external. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm yes. stuck on. I'm stuck on harvesting though. For M, for an MSI package, we harvest at bind time. We harvest yep. the the media and the file table, or we look at the media and file table to to know what we have to harvest. Yes. Is that not the same thing you're talking about here? Well, we we do that today. But bundle package also supports a remote bundle package where you do the harvesting before you bind. So you harvested before compiling. Right. And then you have source code that has the d details of what was harvested and that gets compiled. And then later binding will do its thing. So sorry, I, we're, yeah, we're overloading the word. We're overloading the word harvesting. Yes, yeah, so right. harvest. Not, you're talking about you're, Sean. You're talking about heat level harvesting. I'm, I, I'm not trying to not. overload it because no, no, I, I, people no, are I asking for MSI. Overloaded. People are asking I'm, for MSI think, package to work the same. Yep. as the bundle package well, does today. Yep. Uh, yep. Well, so, okay. But, all right. But so that's let's, weird, let's, so. let's let's wait. All right. Let's back up because there's there's a lot of uh, history on the word harvest. Let's call because. There was a word I was trying to use for a while that I don't think got in there far enough. There's this, I, I was trying to use the word gather for a while. The, the underlying, underlying process behind the user concept of harvest, there is this thing called gathering, right? Which was, you have this thing, gather all the parts up. Here's an MSI package, gather all the parts up. Here now yeah. is a bundle package, gather all the parts up. All right, the, this, these gatherer, the gatherer concept is definitely a building block that gets used both for binding and it get used in the historical harvesting remote payload scenario. So if you consider harvesting the top level thing, which is I think is where Bob's coming from because he's been through all that, and the binding process, both of those end up using the gatherer underneath. If we're, I was yeah, to introduce a new it, word. If we're gonna call it gathering, then the other side of it has to be hunting, obviously. So harvesting <laughs> is right now. Anyway, I, I, I'm not worried about the word. All right, we, we could pick whatever word we want. The word harvest has been overused and has lots of different ways that it's come in. That's what I so was I, saying. Yeah, yeah, is that so? That I think that was the root of that confusion. So whatever you want to call the widget at the bottom that does what Sean was describing as harvesting, because I've seen him rename all these things harvesting, um, and then reuse that functionality both for the remote payload feature and inside binding. Yeah, we're basically decomposing the bundle or the MSI. Yeah, we're, right, we're, right. we're describing the shape of it to feed into a later process. One of those processes is the remote payload process where it, it spits it out as text files that could be, con that could be um, digested by the compiler. And the other option is we feed it straight into the binder so that the files end up inside the files and their metadata the appropriate set of files and the appropriate set of metadata ends up in the final bundle. So that widget at the bottom may need, definitely needs to know which set of files we're talking about. Oh, that was weird. My mic just fit back to me. Right? Right. Hey. Yeah. Still not understanding why you would, at that point in time, we would be picking and choosing what's put in the bundle based on what's actually on the file system. That doesn't make sense to me. It's an option. I mean, I mean, we I don't have to. That could be another option. Yes, like, it could be. It absolutely could. What's available? It absolutely could. I, that's what I'm saying. The idea that you could say ignore all files that have download URLs is interesting, then there's the ignore download URLs, ignore 
files that have downloaded URLs and are missing, right? And I, I put the two together, but you don't have to. You're absolutely correct. You don't have to put them together. They're, they're all these, they are interesting dials. And, and the only reason I, I think of the missing files is because we had scenarios in Visual Studio where we would build web-based downloads simply by copying the appropriate set of files to a new folder. They'd be missing all of the necessary content that the DVD folder would have and the whole system worked from there. And it was, it, it, that's why that whole concept of missing files, uh, that's where that comes from or where we've used it in the past. But I, I agree, it could just be uh, ignore files that have download URLs versus ignore, and, and I don't even know if ignore missing files is interesting or not. It could just it be is. ignore download It files. is interesting because, uh, because you might be using a prepackaged package group that specifies the download URLs, but you want to build an offline installer. Right. Yes. That. So, so which is, for me, which that, is exactly that, that case. Gathering, yeah. The gathering phase at bind time is important because you do want to be able to somehow indicate that, you know, yeah, no, I just because this could be downloaded does not mean that I want it to be downloaded. I mean, this sounds like and, a new concept for a payload to be optional at binding. Well, it's not. There, there are none today. None of the payloads are optional. If they're, if yeah, they're gathered today, they're not optional. It. They're only the remote ones were optional. Like it, you had to be remote to be optional. So the concept of being optional at all during binding is actually um, new. They, out of gathering. The concept of being optional out of gathering is new. Straight out of gathering, as opposed to out of remote payload. But people would have loved to have that for the .NET framework. Would have loved to have that for the .NET framework. Like if they just put the file in the correct spot during binding, that it would be compressed into the bundle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. That's, we have that problem yes. because... We specify remote payloads for all of the redists, yeah. all the .NET Framework redists, which is silly that we have a remote payload, say, for, um, what was the combination? It, is that you, you have a remote payload for the web downloader that was, that's available for .NET. Why, you, know, you, pack, you package up the web downloader that then downloads more stuff completely blows off your your caching progress calculations but yeah um, I, but it means that if you want to embed it you have to author your own and that kind of sucks so i think the answer here is that we need at the high level we definitely need to pull external payloads in for bundles and then for the ones that have download URLs, they could be optional. And how many degrees of freedom do we provide on those that could be optional? Right? Yep. So is it like harvest type? Is the attribute name or yeah, I, I I'm hesitant to use the word harvest because of all the history that it comes with it. Um because I kinda wanted to be declarative where you're saying like everything, nothing, something like that. Yeah, I, I it's definitely agree. an enum, yeah. Yeah. I just don't think we need the word harvest in it to say that. Um, it's, it's essentially it's like what's the external file handling scenario that you want to use do you want to and the default is to include them all because that's the most obvious then after that yeah I like I like external file handling or something along those lines external files include ignore if download url i'm not coming up with yeah, words yeah. right now um 
and then we the, the missing one is the only other one that's like interesting because of the things that we've done in the past or that people want it's just like yeah this if it's here use it if you don't I, and that one's always I was worried a little bit about basing things on found in the file system hmm. but yeah something like automatic payload inclusion <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have the, the words are around here somewhere <laughs> <laughs> I just I I would hesitate of putting the word harvest in it, um, due to its overload history, Jacob. But what if someone tries to create an offline bundle that contains multiple online bundles, offline bundle that contains multiple online bundles? Yeah, so that's the same problem that you have with the. Uh, that's the scenario Bob just brought up. I think maybe you're referring to that. Um, the if a if you have, if you want to do an offline bundle and you are carrying the the web readist, what, what do they call it? NetFX web web net. What do they call it? Yeah, it's it's yeah, NetFX four eight dash web dot xe. If you get that, then you can't get a purely offline scenario, as far as I know, because you nope. are carrying something that's online, and so that's just fundamentally broken. Is it really the gathering processing side, or should we expect them to do a layout if they want to package an online bundle as a child of another bundle? to package an online bundle as a child of another bundle. Well, they, they'd have to. If, if you're trying to essentially recreate an offline, you, you are. At that point, if you want to create an offline bundle of something that is purely online, like you know a, a web-only readist, then yeah, you're going to have to do that. Yeah, slash layout to bring everything local. and then. Yeah. But even then, well, slash layout... I guess slash layout will even fetch download URLs. Yeah, well, that's we'll really put it in the right course. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. So we don't so, want building a bundle to start downloading stuff from the web. It's bad yeah. enough that we have NuGet packages. <laughs> and to be clear, the I, I, the word gathering is an internal uh, piece of the Wix toolset. It's not a user facing thing you don't you as a user you don't use the gathering which is why i don't i was trying to avoid using the word harvesting because we have made that a user facing concept but the gathering widget uh to use that name is an internal piece of the wix tool set that is shared in a couple places one in the remote payload which is the harvesting of old of for remote payloads and then also inside the binder for grabbing MSIs and including all that stuff into your bundle itself. So uh, this gathering process has nothing to do with the actual execution of a bundle. It's all about the creation of them, to be clear. All right, so I don't have a name for the dial, <laughs> but I think we do need this feature because bundle packages are not gonna work unless they are single files right now, essentially, right? Yeah, they're pretty or much they happy manually, files. or they're they all downloaded. Author. Yeah, or you can manually author the payload yourself. That's not much fun. Yeah, okay. Well, but it works fine. Well, never mind. It it's not horrible. This is the this is the the where we get into the the you know harvesting dilemma of normal MSI harvesting. Yes. You might have to do it if you have special scenarios like wanting to create an offline bundle for something that includes online only children. I like the idea of an attribute like external files. Um, I don't like an, external. What are they called? I mean, they're they're payloads. Yeah, I mean, we could call them but payloads. They're, but they're. What if you want to include everything, even compressed stuff? Even compressed stuff. If it's in the bundle XC, you get the bundle XC no matter what, right? Yeah, but you could strip the attached container off. How? Burn 
extract or burn whatever it was to sign it. <laughs> well, uh, don't do that. I, yeah, I never considered someone shipping that. I'm, so I'm, you, you detach would, the. How would it do though? I mean, if you have something that's attached, they've stripped off the attached container. How would you get the files? Extract. <laughs> layout. Mm -hmm. But layout won't attach the, the attached container again. I mean, I, 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 I'd be amazed if Burn did anything where it let you run, where it thought the attached container, where the attached container... It's what well, happens. It? But I guess, yeah, you, if you do a slash layout from the cache, it works. Oh, gosh, that's so wild. I guess that works. You could do a slash layout from the cache, the package cache, I, and point I it to the original source. You and do have it all work. the operations from the cache when it's stripped, even layout. Yeah. Layout's the one that's the weirdest to me. So if you did slash layout, it would prompt for source for the attached container and then yeah. create it. I create a bundle with it attached. No. Layout would only give you a bundle without the attached container. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> I, I was would, say, would that was amazing. Container. I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> it, would, it, it would prompt for the container, and I don't know that you could actually provide a source for the attached container that yeah, isn't can. a bundle. Yeah, well, you have yeah. to get the original bundle. You have again. to get the original bundle. Yeah, yeah. That's, okay. But in 4, you can put uh, download URLs on everything. So if it can't find the container, then it would try to download it if it had a download URL for all the payloads. <laughs> can you actually put a download URL on an attached container? On the content in the attached container. On the content, I yes. I, but I don't think you can do that for an attached container. I might have enabled that. I don't... I'm not... 100% sure. Okay. And if it is, it's the freaky. path to the original bundle. But essentially, because I mean, the attached container doesn't live anywhere. It only lives attached to the XE. That's why it's called attached. <laughs> um, that's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, 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 I've never thought about detaching the engine off of an attached bundle and expecting things to work everywhere that's crazy yep. yeah but that's what you put in the package cache so it kind of has to work oh, i mean install and uninstall for itself yes i it definitely will do that it's the layout scenarios and it's just like really okay because i thought layout copied itself i didn't think it would fix the attached container it won't right. it won't fix it but it would it would it could download the original bundle if that had a download URL, it'd be automatic. Right. It, it'll just copy itself. It won't try to resolve the attached containers. Okay. All right. Okay. I haven't thought through all the things you can do with that yet. So what's the adjective if it's, if it's not external? Well, I want harvest, but you guys don't, so. <laughs> I actually don't care. Um, I don't want harvest. I don't want that's, gather. That's I'm what work, it's doing. <laughs> I, 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 I'm working on what that word means through Wix, throughout Wix. So I don't want that word in the language itself. Well, then I guess we need to rename the symbol that I created then. Because <laughs> I called it harvested bundle package payload. Yes, it, I, I saw that. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. It's the internal symbol. I'm... I'm I mean that's it's, what it is. So I don't. I don't expect the word can be generated too, or, or calculated, or otherwise. It doesn't have to be the word harvested. Um, the word gathered could work too. I'm not big on the word gathered either, but um, I, I don't. I don't want that. I don't want the concept exposed in you know an attribute name, because then we have to explain the the concept. External, I think, works because. The ninety percent case is that these are things that are explicitly, you know, uh, 
fine. They're not explicitly marked. What you, uncompressed? Uncompressed file handling? Compressed or uncompressed is the closest we have today to a word that is already exposed in the language because the pro- the, we, we the, have bundle compressed. I, 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 don't, I don't hate it. The only problem is that containers are compressed and they are external. See, the problem is we don't expose the concept of attached containers. No. Um, I don't it's, think we... It's exposed. You can create attached containers. No, I know, but we don't... We don't ex- sorry, it's not, it's not exposed in the language. Right now, an attached container happens when you say bundle compressed equals yes. No, you can create a container with attached equals yes. Oh, okay. I don't remember when that came. That's, yeah... Because that's, that's the thing that allows multiple attached containers, right? I mean, it was there in three, but you could only have one. It, it, yeah. Well, yeah. And it was but you no couldn't author to it. create detached containers. You could right. author it in three, and you would have your own special name for the container instead of the default. It wasn't useful. Yeah. But it was in the language. Isn't it, but I thought attached equals no was how you created created detached containers. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that was mildly useful. Yes, wasn't very useful. No, I'm I'm oh, it meant attached equals yes was yeah, not okay. useful in three. Well, but what if you really wanted to name your attached container? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Um... So, what do you call the process where? It's inspecting the bundle and the manifest, and it's getting all the information it needs to build the bundle. The process that I was starting to, I was starting to call that gathering. That's not. To I avoid would, the word harvesting. Yeah. <laughs> because but you of said the bags it was gathering was used in another place in the binder, which sounds a much better use of gathering than that. Sorry. I, wait, say that again. All right, ask your question again. I thought gathering in the binder was where it was trying to resolve all the files and trying to no, get that's everything re- together. No, that's resolving. I think that's all done during resolve. Well, wh- what is the second place of this gathering process? Because you referred to it as being... For- MSI packages twice. was the one where we first started doing this concept of gathering, where it was this internal... Uh, gathering of information and generating code. It's like link time code generation is essentially what it was. And we didn't do a lot of that. We definitely didn't do very much of it in MSI because there's so many implications on when you generate code, you have to think about the patching implications, which ends up making things way more complicated. But in bundles, slowly got to a place where we're like, you know what, we can actually generate significant amounts of this because we control the engine. The engine has these needs. So that is when we were like, oh, look, you don't have to author all of the parts about an MSI, which is really annoying. How about we just look at the MSI? It tells us every single file that it could use, Delta, uh, custom actions, reaching out and grabbing arbitrary files. Uh, we will know all of them. And so it was like, great. So we just wrote the thing and said, good. You can gather all the information on the MSI and put it into the bundle and it will just work. And so that was that. that. And it was never exposed. It just... You know, the internal process did it. I guess my problem with calling it gathering is that most of the work is inspecting the bundle and figuring out what to gather. But I don't know. You could call it hunting and gathering and then, I mean, Bob will be happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a word, right? We, we could call it... Uh, I mean, we could call it link time code generation that we wanted, which is essentially what is happening. It's like, hey, we're going to generate a lot of code here at this time. And we're starting to do more of that in MSI as we get more comfortable with being able to generate stable identifiers for constructs. So this this concept of being able to generate more in the back ends is going to become more prevalent, I hope, in order to simplify the front end of the language. That's, I mean, that's what I'm hoping we keep working towards, right? And the word harvesting, the reason I just avoided word harvesting through all of this is that it's 
it has a history of what it means and how it comes in. And I am trying to work through actively how to address that word, given that it is a public word and we it's exposed like in the uh, Wix Proj, for example. Still trying to work my way through what all that means. So that's why I don't use that word for that concept inside the tools, even though you know the gathering, the widget, whatever you want to call that parse is a key part of code generation, which the thing that is harvesting has used significantly. Code generation is a very large part of what harvesting has been. And even then, code generation is a great term because it's the difference between generating source code versus generating right. internal symbols or just final output in the case of like the manifest of the bundle and things like that. So all of that is why I don't like the word harvesting being used for any of these um, pieces. Given its history. It's kind of we burn that word. It's like we can't use the word component for anything anymore. Or we can use it for pretty much everything. Or we just use it for everything. Then it doesn't mean anything, um, which is only going to be worse. And you can see it in the beginning of this conversation where Bob's like, wait, harvesting is these things. You're like, no, harvesting is these things. And that word has a place. That's why I'm avoiding it. So we just have to detach from that word, find what a better word is. And you know, maybe link time code generation is a better way to come at it. Code generation as opposed to source code generation. I don't know. I don't know. This is when I sometimes drop into um, yeah, reaping or integrating. Uh, this is when I yeah try to drop into like what are the other languages like? Where's Rosa? Because Rosa has a lot of these same things, you know. And they've like they have the word emit in their word, their world. And I'm fuzzy on where LLVM has these, but it's just kind of like what are these compiler concepts that we're doing um, and trying to solve these backend problems? So. So do you want to call it payload generation? Absolutely. Payload generation, I think, is totally fine. There we go. Fine. Totally there. fine. It's nice and generic. It doesn't promise anything. Generator is a word that can be used for many different things, and you need an adjective to say what it's generating immediately. You're like, there's the generator. You're like, yeah, okay, what is it generating? Yeah, payload generation, payload generator, payload. I think generator is the noun verb of that right what the noun verb the, the noun <laughs> language things the noun word <laughs> oh sorry i do That's think different. i said verb which is why i stopped and went wait what did i do <laughs> i seg faulted right there um uh yeah it's, generator it's a is a noun yes is the noun for generating right right which gets us away from the whole hunter gathering harvesting agrarian and not uh, concepts. I don't know. I, know. I now want to fit agrarianism into this somehow. <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to get away from that. Um, so yeah, maybe payload generation is the way to go. Yeah, I like and it. I, I very much prefer the word generated or harvested. I think that definitely says what it is. It was generated as opposed to um, input. Yeah. Which is the difference between harvesting it for MSI content and harvesting and oh, generating the payloads by inspecting an MSI's media table. Right. Right. Much more comfortable with those names. Yeah, see. I Payload generation. Was... So I think that's it. Now, that still doesn't solve our our attribute name of external files or generate yeah, payloads. Wanted, it could be generate payloads. Payload. I generate. wanted payload generation. Yeah. Oh, payload Sorry, generation that's... as the, oh, I see that as the name payload generation. Yeah. Actually default. Skip download your, yeah. Ignore download URLs. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I just, I think ignoring download URL, what you were talking about, Ignoring missing files is a separate feature request. But it fits in, it, it fits into the email. Because you choose to make it a separate feature request, but yeah, sure. <laughs> it could definitely be a piece of this, but I, that's fine. I, I, I think ignoring download URLs certainly is a, uh, a good dial to have, and we can, it, we can ignore the one for fi missing files um, 
it certainly no. can be an ad. So this comes to my main problem that I was trying to express, that generating the payloads is done at one point in time, and binding is done at a separate point in time. So this attribute is determining what is, which payloads are generated, and then the separate feature request is the bind time feature of ignoring payloads, of dropping payloads from the bundle if they're not existing on the file system. When, when is it done? I mean, it has to be at, it's post-resolution, pre-bind, pre-backend? No, it's in the backend. Yeah, it's in the backend. I, sorry, there, in Wix 3, there was a big distinction between compiling, linking, and binding. And binding was the first point at which you had to have pay, you know, payloads on the system. Um, in compiling and linking, it was just recorded. Your source information, payload source information was recorded, but never acted on. So you could do a whole bunch of things um, if you were really, you know, into that. And too many places were, you could do compiling and linking and do binding as a separate process. Uh, but you could even do most binding, of them. Yeah, you can even do parts of resolve. We, we, we supported doing parts of resolve yeah, without yeah. the files too. Right. So the, the genera this generation that we're talking about is part of binding for bundles so far. Yeah, it's basically burn has two stages in the binding where it does the gathering and then it does the binding. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not going to... Yeah. The, the overall process is bind. Um, I, 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 you're talking about there's a part where it scans the disk and does all that kind of stuff, and then there's another part that actually expects the files so they can be compressed, right, Sean? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that overarching process is called bind today. Um, and the, there isn't a breakdown of the internal workings of that today. So I don't think we could say gathering is separate from binding. No, the, what, the sort of payload generation, whatever, the thing that does the work, the payload generator is a piece of binding. And then later on the files can be, um, compressed. That first part definitely chooses the set of things that will get compressed that's fine, and that will flow through the system. That's true, but that overall chain process is bind. And both touch the file system, even if it's... Yeah, bind... Payload bind, generation yeah. Is, could be read-only. Uh, it could be. Or, well, it can't be, because that's... You're right, yes, it can be. Yeah, no, touches the file system, but can be read-only, yes. Sorry, by read-only, I meant inspect-only. It doesn't look at the content of the files, just that they're there. No, I think it has to open no, the bundle. No, it does. In the no, you're right. You're right. No, never mind. Okay. It, it's very analogous to the MSI. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, bind is bind is a big thing. I mean, yes. that's the extent of yes. the back end today, right? Yes. Back yes. end? Yes. You bind. That yes. That could do a whole lot of stuff. Yes, exactly. Yep. I used to have this concept of the front of the... the yeah. Back end and the back of the back end, which used to drive Bob crazy, just trying to no, figure no, out. it's just amusing. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting I, idea, but I don't. I think we've gotten away from all that. That we don't need that. It it complicates things a lot. <laughs> well, find as as a concept, as a generic concept, has to be broad because of all the possible things yeah, that yeah. any potential back end could do. Yeah, we, we're you know we. We know how MSIs run, how MSI bind. We know how bundles bind. Does it? Does that look different for you know an MSIX package or? Well, we you know, know it does, but yeah. Anyway. Well, yes, we do. We do know it. Does. <laughs> anyway, but the, the concept is still there. Yes. So, bind is the overarching back end part, and it has. Most of the way we've written the binders today is they tend to do most of their read operations first and then their write operations last. They tend to be organized that way. Which makes sense why you're talking about a payload generation earlier and that later in the bind process handles actually getting all the files. That makes sense to me. All right. Payload generation as the attribute is interesting. And the default is to get all the payloads, right? 
the default is to get all the external files. Right, that's default. Yep. And then there's ignore if download URL or whatever I want to say. There. I have a suggestion in the ticket. Oh. Look at Bob getting ahead of us. Except I have to refresh. I haven't submitted it yet. Oh well, that's not helpful. All right. Well, I, I don't. I don't want to actually discuss it. It's just a joke, and now you've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best present this year was a broken drum. You can't beat that. All right, moving on. <laughs> Did I ruin that too? <laughs> yep. 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 Um. Uh, six seven five three. Uh, we're talking to Visual Studio team about this one. That's the update on 6753. Can't open solution contains Wix project Visual Studio 2022 preview. We're talking to Visual Studio team right now about that. Uh, we're Fire Giant, Fire Giant. Visual Studio team has reached out and we're working with them. We're gonna figure out how we're gonna, what we're gonna do here. So, um, I don't want this issue. Um, let's just save it for two weeks. We'll see where they, if, yeah. If we have to fix it, or Visual Studio has to fix it, or we are. They haven't fixed it yet. No, no, which no. It's kind of annoying, but they are looking at it. So. No, we think they found it. So now yeah. the question is, what's the way out? All right, we're at ten forty-two. Are we going to eleven to try to get these last three? Can we do that? Or is that just folly, and we should just give up now? Uh, we well, should do I... those three, or do the one you skipped? I skipped one. Oh, did I hit refresh. Bundle package should be the fallback. To the package cache. All right, we definitely, let's talk about this. Uh, 6756, bundle package should be able to fall back to the package cache. For XE packages, burn always needs to cache the XE before it can run it. Yep. For bundle package, burn is doing the same thing, but theoretically it can fall back to the bundle's own cache in the package cache. If, sorry, so this uh, is if the child bundle uh, is already installed? Yeah, I, I like I I like it. Sean, if you're willing to do this, I like it. Especially this last part here. It should at yeah. least support uninstalling the bundle package using XE from the package cache if source is available, just like MSI packs could be uninstalled without source. Although they can't be uninstalled without source and burn. Yeah, they can. We just uninstall them by the product code, right? At least the three, we cache. The yeah, cache we, can't be empty. Yeah, you could delete the MSI from the cache and burn will be like, all right, I can uninstall that. Yep. Uh, I don't think it was that way in three. But I agree it should. I think this is a fantastic feature. feature. Not enough that I'm going to take it on myself, but I think it would be really cool. <laughs> so, Sean, if you're willing to do it, I think it's great. I haven't. I need to wrap my head around exactly what this means. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yep. I agree with that statement right there. I think it'd be cool. Do you want this in 4O, Sean, or 4X? So I guess what I was looking for is should we support operations other than uninstall? Hmm. Yes. Uh, this is a dial. I mean, no, just yes. We, we we can dial it down to no. You must cache it. To we can support uninstall all the way up to, yeah. We'll just use it if it's there. What do we do in the case of MSI? We have to cache it unless it's uninstalling. But that's because we always cache during. I mean. It, is, let me ask that differently. Is there a way to not cache during repair, or reinstall, install? No, you, you can don't... throw away the cache, but is it possible? Yes. Is it easy to do? I doubt it. <laughs> no, like, can, can a BA actually ask the burn? To, sorry, sorry. Can a BA ask the burn engine to do that? No. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. So I think the answer to, in, I think this should be the same then. Until we let our willing. Until we choose to let burn skip caching something because it can find it. Yeah. What were we saying? So, yeah, it says during repair, 
that we're not going to put things back in the cache. Yeah, no. It makes total sense. I think it should be the same for MSI package. If bundle package can act the same as MSI package in this case, I think that's awesome. On yeah, install and all that, we're just going to cache because it's it's not a bundle package thing that we're caching. It's just that's what we do, right? If you're going forward, we cache the packages. If you're going back, if, if you're installing, repairing, going forward, then we put things in the cache. And if you're going backwards, we don't try to put things back in the cache if we can avoid it. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, this should be doable. And it'd be awesome if we could do the same for XE packages, except we don't, we'd don't. we have to have them tell us a way to detect their uninstall string, for example, which would be the feature for XE packages, I guess. This XE package can be uninstalled with this uninstall string, can be detected here with the uninstall string, so you don't need it for uninstalling. Except we always run the XE with that uninstall string. Right, right, right. It would right, have right. to be an uninstall location. Yeah, it would have to be a... Okay. A, or a, when I register, I register an ARP under this key. Go ahead and uninstall me there. Gotcha. Like, that would, would be, be the way of making the, the concept generic for both XEs and bundles, because bundles right. will say the same thing. That's I true. register here, and then just read my uninstall string, and let's go. Same for the XE package. If you can't find me, go ahead and do my uninstall from here. I, at, I'm not saying we should do that feature. I'm just saying that's kind of the generous. It would be cool if we did that for all things because then we'd be able to always uninstall without having to cache because caching during uninstall is really annoying. Yeah. Please provide the original source media so we can remove this. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Nobody well, likes it, that. It, it's, uh, Inno set up and probably Ansys as well. They write separate uninstallers and today we don't do well with that. It, and actually, that that's another case where this would be even be all right. Should open that feature request, the ability for XE package to specify their uninstall key, their ARP uninstall key. So Sean, if you choose to do that, you, it would be awesome if you maybe kept that in the back of your mind. Say, like, hey, yeah, and if I do this, then it's just launch this XE, launch this uninstall string, essentially. I don't know, something to think about. I mean, I could implement it like that. For bundles too, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. I, the hard part for XEs is... Well, no, because most of the XE packages have a fixed... They all have a fixed... Oh, it's, that's... You, they all have a fixed uninstall key. Uh, parent... Yeah, key. Um, ARP key. Right? And then the uninstall string is underneath that. Well, yeah, maybe that's a... That's a thing. There's something there, I think. Yeah, we'll see how that works. That would be allow us to uninstall NSYS and Inno setup as well as bundles. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool, actually. Yeah. All right. Let's see where we end up here. It's 2393. As you can tell, we've jumped from the 6,000s to the 2,000s, so we've done back in time. Um, light XE makes no difference between a common and a semicolon. All provided cultures are provided are specifying the fallback sequence for light, independent of the use of separation character. Only votive makes such a difference. All right, so this is a documentation thing? No. But we removed documentation. Who knows how far back? Um, this is all about fallback languages. And... I think the representation inside um, Wix projects. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the differences were supposed to be, and it was primarily, as I recall, it was it was to allow multiple regions um, within the same language. No, I think so you could have ENUS comma ENGB, uh, right. or vice versa. It was like yes. Your your ultimate fallback, but within a language, uh, or an ultimate ultimate regional fallback within a language. So you can yes. do en engb, comma enus, which would let you create you know MSIs with extra U's in them, and then if you didn't quote unquote translate um, to add those extra U's, you would fall back to U.S. English. Yeah, so I, I don't know that it matters in 
at all, really. It's no, just, it, it, it does. It becomes an order. No, in Wix Proj, the semicolon ends up splitting, so you multi, you build multiple MSIs. So you build. With oh, the, the I semicolon see. allows you to build, for example, EN, ENUS, comma, ENGB, semicolon, uh, uh, I need another language that I don't know. Uh, the Spanish. FRFR. Uh, uh, FR, I don't know what the other... FRFR Arabic fall back to FRFR French, right? right or whatever, right, right. right? So the comma separates the... Yeah. The comma separates the fallbacks. The semicolon separates the request to have language built. And it's only an MS build. It's not votive. It's only an MS build feature. It's right, not right. a command line feature. Because on the command line, you run the command line multiple times. That's how that works. There's no way of doing multiple outputs. And and in the end, it's it's batching, target batching. So yeah. I guess this is, the, the feature request must be a doc thing. Well, apparently I didn't think so back in December 2013. Yeah, Light should understand that. No, I don't think Light should understand build. Light, Wix.exe build. The build command, I don't, uh, we're not, we're still not building multiple outputs from one command line invocation. Um, we can revisit light, that light another time. Light takes a culture switch. Yes, but those are the fallback but, cultures. But the, yeah, those are those are fallback cultures within right, one good. output. All right. Those okay. are like Blair disagrees. That's good. All right. So, um, I, uh, Give this to me. I want to make sure the MS build. No, the MS build stuff does work because I have it working. This is a doc issue. It's somewhere in our doc, we must have this written down, and it's confusing. And it's we need to basically say this comma semicolon is only a, a MS build feature, a, a Wix proj feature. It's okay. not a vote feature. It's a MS build feature. Through MS build, you can get. Your Wix project to build multiple languages. That's essentially the answer. Okay, I'll 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 take that. It's probably okay. somewhere in the. Uh, um, yeah, we have documentation on Wix project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Target features, targets features. Right. So. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, allow managed servers and class element to register this and you set mproc server to MS Core EE, and I can't see how to do this. Oh, that is not installed by your setup. Yeah, this is a great feature. Um, registering class, manage classes, and enhancing the class element to do that better. Uh, we can put it into 4X. I think it's just additive. I think it can be done additively. Additively? But yeah, it'd be great if someone wanted to do that feature. I don't know how many managed comm servers there are anymore, but... Well, in the 15 years since the bug was open, people have been clearly chomping Chomp. at the bit to get this done. Yeah. Yeah. Also, oh, mentioned that like can't make multiple languages in one invocation. That is correct. Boy, you cannot make multiple invocations. All right. 702, last one. Uh, this is an ancient bug because <laughs> Derek opened it. Um, there are some limits in Windows installers that we could validate to prevent. Hey, Zach, that's great. It's actually, Zach, thank you for saying that. I'm like, it's the world of tech, maybe just Twitter, I don't know. People don't talk about the fact that they're actively still making technology using old, old, calm, old functionality, you know, existing functionality. So it's nice to know that people are still using it because it tells us, you know, people still use this. We still need to make it work. So anyway, thanks, Zach. That does help us know that, uh, well, like we shouldn't get rid of it. It still has value. Those kinds of things. All right. But um, we can we can still mock like MSMQ, right? Uh, That's still okay. Uh, DCOM? No, <laughs> I forget. <laughs> See? One of those is bad. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, I don't know actually know where MSMQ is. I mean, MSMQ wasn't bad. DCOM was pretty brutal. No, if but it falls. No, into no, no, no. The, it wasn't so much really, DCOM. Really it was DTC, MSDTC. Yeah, that thing was. Anyway, who cares? Um, <laughs> Probably someone. 
please add more here if you know them. And I think we've gotten no additional ones added. <laughs> um, but there are these two checks. You know what? Give this to me and I will, I'm, I'm going to be, I think I have another book very similar to this and it should be straightforward to add it. And I'll just pick up these two things. It, it is a good thing to add just to cut off, to head off the problems. Well, this, I mean, these are, you know, are these things not covered by ICES, for example, and would be you know, better served than an icebreaker type project? Maybe. I mean, the, so ISIS catches this kind of stuff as well as the, you know, yeah, oh, for Windows is, 9X, you don't want more than you know, 800 components per feature or yeah, whatever. Yeah, but it is. this is a build failure. Like, we, you, your MSI is not going to work. Like, we should not be building the MSI at all. It's not a static analysis thing. It's a, your MSI is broken if you get over these things. Mm, okay. Yeah, it doesn't open. Like, I don't even know if you could validate an MSI that has a feature tree depth of 17. Well, can you build it? I mean, you probably could build it. Fail yeah, yeah at, you could build it because it's just IDTs. Time. We're just shoving them in there. But like, well, because validation is doing an install, MSI validation is doing an install, yeah. I, they may fail when it's like, oh, I can't handle this. And it blows up because the engine doesn't like this. Right, right. Anyway. I'll take, I, let me, this is straightforward. I'll drop it in and be that. All right. All right. We got through it. Triage, good stuff. I knew we'd have triage today. Oh, anyway. uh, other things people want to talk about. Why you guys think about things that you want to talk about. Um, we'll see how many bugs we get in the next two weeks. I guess we've had, oh, opened 27 days, 26, 28 days. So we made it through. If we would have been through all of our bugs last week, we would not have had any this week. So I guess we'll see in two weeks if we'll still have bugs. Uh, we'll do that but we'll definitely be back so two weeks is may 12 is that correct i think that's right gotta jump a boundary here so that would be may 12 i want someone to check rob's math oh dude date math yeah don't it, it mm. please please do i am we all know our weaknesses and that is definitely one of mine uh all right so pretty quiet wix3 build for Vigia Extension for VS2022 properties. Uh, yeah, the Wix 3 build. Um, Bob, I was waiting on something from you, I thought, for the Wix 3 build. As, um, okay. I thought there was a doc thing. You have to tell thing. me about these things. No, no, no. There was a doc thing or something that was getting fixed that was going to get pushed all the way around so we didn't have to do other stuff. Uh, your your words are not evoking any memories for me. All right, all right. Um, I have to start writing everything down. My memory doesn't hold anything anymore. Um, yeah, I guess we can. I'll have to go through, do the work. The I think I fixed the bug with the arm build stuff. So hopefully everything will work. If not, I'll have to do that. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll go All kick right. a build here. I'm going to take a quick look and see if I can trigger what that doc thing was that we were talking about. Ah, what was that? Um, that's not coming to me. All right. Um, yeah, all right. We'll kick a, a Wix 3 build before the next meeting. I'll, I'll, we'll do that. Before the next meeting, there'll be another a Wix 3 build. And uh, it may or may not include the doc fix that I can't. I swear there was something that was like, yeah, it'd be nice if this was just fixed. Anyway, there's that. Because I'm feeling petty in the support document, a rim shot is produced by simultaneously hitting the rim and the head of the drum of the stick. There we go. Um, so. But my message is too long for chat. <laughs> Chat has a limit on how many uh, thing, how much you can. Two hundred characters. Two hundred characters. Oh, I see it now. Yeah, oh. Down there. Mm -hmm. uh, so does that, Ron? Does that mean we need to drop it in to somewhere else, or Wix a summary? Wix devs. Yeah. We always have mail. 
Yeah, I know. All right, tell you what. If if it's not pressing, Ron, now I have to wait 10 seconds. If it's not pressing, then we'll uh, let's see if we can get it queued up enough that we can have an answer or a discussion about it in the next meeting. Because I'm really hoping in the next meeting we don't have more than an issue or two or none um, to talk about. So we'll have the other things to go talk about if it's not pressing. And you can just drop it on waste devs or whatever, and we can work it around to getting it discussed. Cool, 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 cool. I hope. All right. All right. Um, anything else? Anything else? Killing time here. Uh, this is where I really wish I had the immediate. When they say immediate communication with your feedback, I wonder what it's like if I run at reduced communication speed. Like, is there a 20 second delay? 30 second delay? Who knows? Um, it is fantastic to have all of you in chat with us here today. Zach, Ron, Blair. We missed Jacob this week, didn't we? All right. Um, all of you, it's Jacob, great yeah. to have you here. Uh, no, we, no he's, Jacob's he's here. here. Yeah, Jacob's yeah. here. See, he even said things, and I even responded to those things. <laughs> all right. I tell you what, man. Trying to talk and think at the same time is, like, think about one thing, talk about another thing. It's, it's challenging. I'm just trying to figure out. All right. I think I fill enough space. Ron, go, let's get your question at least started in mail or something, and then we'll go from there. We'll be back in two weeks, 9.30. May 12th Pacific time and we'll do this all again. So until then, all you guys take it easy and we'll be back then. Bye. Bye. Bye.